So tell me your name and what you do. Shad me Shad. What do I do? That's really a good question. For since Vietnam, I've been asking myself that question. What do I do? I, I guess I would say that I do things that help war fighters and their families and kids transition back to America or to civilian life. That's probably the most simple way to put it. I'm trained as a psychiatric social worker many years ago, 50 something years ago. My story has been a story of miracles. I mean, just being here today, going on 75 in a couple of months, and it's just ongoing. It's like spinning wheel. It just keeps going, and we keep going to war, and men and women keep coming back, and it's probably, at least in our country, the toughest uh, readjustment to make to cross that bridge, it's, it's extremely difficult to do for many, not all, and it depends a lot on your pre-war experience, yeah. which we now know, your experience in war, and what tools do you have, whether you have family or whatever to come back to. Yeah. And even with all that, in, in my 48 years this month, starting this work, after Vietnam, it's still the biggest challenge. If you've ever done improvisational theater, I've become great at improv. Even though I'm a therapist, you have to because, like I said, many cultures, many backgrounds, many races, many religions. Even though my career started here, eventually I have taken my work throughout this country and into five or six countries outside of here in discussion about readjusting, coming home from the war and the problems and discussion of things at work, whether it's diagnosing mental issues. Right. You know, out of Vietnam, one of the great things you always said, besides me coming out of Vietnam <laughs> and a few other million guys and gals, was the definition of PTSD. Right. And I was happy to be involved in that in the 70s with some really, uh, intelligent focused men, some veterans, some not, mm -hmm. that were interested in this, what's this post-Vietnam syndrome that's going on, and through years of interaction, discussion, and in meetings and stuff, it finally got called post-traumatic stress. That's a story in itself, but it did happen, and in 1980 we did have a diagnosis that was other than schizophrenia, yeah. care disorder, and other diagnosis that really were not not comp compensable. You couldn't, you know, set a value mm -hmm. on it. You right. know, if you were schizophrenic, fine, they put you uh, away, medicate you, and let you age <laughs> in a building. Right. And if you were a character disorder, uh, like a majority of those with what we know as PTSD, it was like nothing. You just couldn't handle authority and you didn't get any benefits and there was no place to go. Right. So let's start, you, you were talking about the experience depends upon your pre-war, your war, and your post-war experience. Let's start with you. Tell me a little bit about how you got to the Vietnam War. and that, That's an interesting story. I mean, great. They're, all of them are great stories. I've heard <laughs> thousands of those stories. But my story starts as a uh, Southern Catholic in Alabama, northern Alabama, which had only two things, two Catholic high schools in the whole state, one in, on the Gulf and one in Birmingham. I was Catholic in, in, in the 40s and 50s when I was raised in early 60s. Blacks, Catholics, and Jews were excluded from the city. We couldn't, our sports, we couldn't play in the city. Blacks had the worst discrimination because you could see their color. Jews, well, they owned the businesses and stuff, and they were allowed, but they, they had their centers and stuff. Uh, they weren't impoverished like the blacks. And the Catholics, we weren't really impoverished, but we didn't have really any power. And we were made up of mostly Irish, Italian, and other denominations. I'm French Lebanese and half Scotch Irish. I mean, that kind of mix, we were other, being Catholic. So I, I thought that's the way it was. Uh, right. growing up, but uh, a great big Catholic family, good parents I had, Catholic education, 
then it was affordable. <laughs> right. And I had nuns the first 12 years in Jesuits the, the last uh, four years and a year in the seminary. So anyway, I was, you know, raising basically the films, World War II films, which are still going today. They're still making movies, The Great War. The Audie Murphys, the, the John Waynes, I think I was, I was fascinated by it. I had my cowboy outfit and, you know, I, you know to, to a reasonable amount. And then all of a sudden you hit high school and there's talk about this war in the Southeast Asia. And you're thinking, wow, well, that might be the war, but it didn't sound like anything big. So anyway, as I said, I went, I went into the seminary at Spring Hill College and then that was not really my calling. I think I did that out of Catholic guilt. You know, they need, we need priests. And I stayed, finished my degree there. But while I was there, I joined ROTC because mm -hmm. I heard talk and I said, wow, I want to be, I'll be an officer. I'll be, you know, Captain John Wayne or whatever. It's just kind of a conversation. You never talk about it that way. So I went through ROTC for junior year. They sent us the, those that got selected for the last two years that looked like possibility they could be soldier. We sent the basic. Well, I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina with the 82nd. So I trained the summer 65 with the 82nd. Got a glimpse of what war's like and particularly uh, the people that trained us were, had just come back as advisors in Vietnam. The war had really just kicked off 64, 65, but mm -hmm. they had, some of them had been there earlier. About a third of my class was beat out. I mean, within three weeks. I, I, I just thought, man, this is like summer football training for the season in the South. It's hungry. We trained on glass. I mean, our coach was a cannibal. That, so I was, <laughs> I survived it because, hey, this is pretty brutal. Right. I went into basic at 170. I came out at 140. I didn't have an ounce of fat on me. Didn't have any when I went there. Was pretty, pretty happy to survive just the basic training. And so my senior year, continued with some of the more advanced training in jungle where, what welfare, which was minimal. And uh, I remember we had this Green Beret sergeant, and I've told this story in a class I did 20 years straight at UC Santa Barbara. I helped start a class on the Vietnam War. It ran for 20 years after the war, 79 to 2004. And uh, I've told this story. so. Sergeant Donahue, I'll never forget, this Irish guy, he's 6'2", just looked like the G.I. Joe statues you see in the store. I mean, just buffed and whatever, but never smiled, just looked at us like we were trash. And there's 22 of us that are going to graduate at the end of 66 to get our second lieutenant bars in one of the branches. I had went through infantry. He comes in, he has one of these old screens and one of these old projectors. And he, he looks at us and we're just waiting to see, you know, we're all kind of goofy and ready to get out and whatever. And he goes, just want to let you know, girls, that maybe one or two of you, from, from what I see, and it's the first time you've seen us, that might make it into war. And maybe one of you might make it out. And we're like, you know, like, what is he talking about? He says, okay, show you a little film. Clicks on the video, you know, it's a black and white, but you know, it gets dark. And all of a sudden we see these soldiers, American soldiers going in, you know, with all the stuff you see today in movies, but in black and white, and they have just swept a village. In the village, there's just dead bodies everywhere. And uh, all of a sudden we see Sergeant Major you know, he's got all the black, and this is real footage. And we're kind of locked right on him, and all of his men are down there stacking these VC bodies together, and they start cutting the ears off and other body parts. One guy cut the penis off, stuck it in the map, stuck one of his cards on, and they're, they're filming it like, you know, it's in your every act, and you remember, I'm in a Jesuit college, and, and I'm in this room, and I'm seeing horrors for real. Right. This isn't a horror movie. This isn't the House of Wax, Vincent Price. This is Sergeant Donnelly, and he's there, and it's smiling like, this is great. And then he clicks it off. And there's three people 
that are just, everybody's down like this, and there were two of us that just were staring, and we looked, looked at him kind of like, what? And he goes, uh, I think you two guys might make it. You, you were able to at least look. Class over. And 20, 19 or 20 walked out and were throwing up outside, and, and nobody could talk. I'm like, what, what is he doing? So the next class, he comes in there and says, you know, I don't want you to think you're going in there and you're going to be one of these commercials and you're going to be whatever. If you're going to go to, to war, which you're being trained to, and you probably will, you're going to have to do this. And you're right, you know, inside you go, what? You know, I, you know, I, it just, it just, I can still feel it in a way, like, I ain't doing that. <laughs> You know, but I didn't say anything, and it was like, uh, girls, this is, you know, for become a man, you're going to have to, because war is about killing, annihilating the enemy, and all of a sudden, he started about jungle warfare, and we sat through the class, and most of them stayed in, but they had to, because we were going to graduate, and we, you know, they were going, finishing four years of ROTC, you wanted to get your bars, if you didn't, you were thinking, man, I'd be enlisted, and I'd have to be under this guy, if this is what they're like. Because we're innocent. We are like girls. We, I mean, we were tough but innocent. I mean, we were naive. You were kids. We were. And sure enough, uh, May rolled around. I got my mother pinned my gold bar, you know, infantry. But I never got that image out. And one of the great things was I, I, I got a, a fellowship to go to graduate school. I, I was like, I'm going to go to graduate school, can I, whatever, because most everybody were going to their advanced training, whether it was ranger school, advanced, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. all the different branches. And all of a sudden, I've got a fellowship, and it gets approved by DOD. There's 3% of my class in the nation that got deferments for 36 months, and I was one of them. First miracle in my life. And they're going to come fast if you have time to listen to me. So I go to graduate school. Two years and a year after that to do a postdoc, a postgraduate thing, focused on, you know, something I thought I was going to go into, which was prison, the prison system, because I'd done some interns in prisons and I really liked it. I really liked working with prisoners and, and criminals for whatever reasons. You know, it was fascinating. Still is, but, uh, and I finished graduate school, and every month, you know, they, my mother would send an article and. Two high school buddies were killed in 67, and then another one was killed, and then two high school fraternity brothers were killed from 66, 67, 68, and the guilt was building up. And here I am, Florida State, uh, young, beautiful women, graduate school. It was just, it was, you, you go through a Jesuit education, Graduate school was relatively easy for me, yeah. and, you know, and I wasn't a science major. I wasn't a pre-med. I mean, social work, psychology, and uh, sociology was uh, under the social science department. I got I focused mine in correctional social work because I wanted to do prison work. Schools have changed, but this is 50 years ago, and so I get my degree, and I still have a year, and so I got a job in the prison system in Georgia, still in the reserves, right. as a second lieutenant infantry. And I'm just waiting to be called to go in, get my advanced, and head to Nam. And I get a letter from the Department of Office that says, basically, in, in layman's terms, it says, you're, you're an infantry officer, but we'd like to offer you a mental health branch, the Medical Service Corps, because of your degree. We're setting up for the first time mental health units in the service, particularly in the war zone, and we'd like to transfer you to Medical Service Corps. So on paper, at 23, I take this gold bar off and I add two silver bars. On paper, I'm the youngest captain in the military, 23-year-old captain. Haven't done anything but party. Have only thing I survived was basic training with the 82nd. A miracle. The average <laughs> lifespan of a second lieutenant in the field at that time was 60 seconds. It's the first person they take out is either the radio man or the lieutenant. You usually get the lieutenant, and they were going like that. And by the time 
68 role and I had to go on active duty in 69, I have to go to Fort Sam Houston to get my medical training because you got to have medical training. The, the psych, psychological training was nothing. It was a manual right. and, and it was fun, but it was nothing to do. But meanwhile, I'm, I'm, I look like a kid. I'm a 23 year old. People are, you know, you got all these trading officers with captain bars and, and major bars and they're looking at you like, what, you know, what are you doing here? You know, and I, I finished the branch school and I went to Fort Leavenworth military prison.